It is my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, two of our longtime faculty here. Uh, due to a, a glitch in getting their bios, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly where they went to medical school and all that stuff, but I'll ask each of them to just give a short introduction. But anyway, we have uh, Dr. Rob Little, who's been at Phoenix Children's for over 20 years uh, in the PCH Neurology Department, and he uh, specializes in both headaches uh, and uh, working with the neuro-oncology patients. And then Dr. John Curran has also been at Phoenix Children's probably uh, almost as long. Uh, one of our first neuroradiologists here. Were you the first? No, Dr. Miller. Okay, okay. But shortly after, I think Dr. Miller got here, Dr. Curran came here. And so uh, back in the day, we did not have neuroradiologists. So he was one of the first. And uh, their topic this morning is imaging and the diagnosis of headaches. Thank you, Dr. Curran. Good morning. So um, I want to say there's a fair amount of content in this, but this is, as you know, the PCH Grand Rounds are now up on YouTube. So I wouldn't worry too much about if you miss something or, you know, you find our slides too cluttered with anything, just go to YouTube in a week or two and you can look at it in your leisure, look up some points that you need to cover. As mentioned by Dr. Hartley in his kind introduction, our talk this morning is imaging and the diagnosis of headache. And I want to point out that while it, it would be a privilege to belong to the neurology department, we did have a problem with the slides and it shifted neurology from Rob over to under me, but he's neurology and neuroradiology. But I'm just mentioning that in case some of the slides look a little funny, we were not able to control that. Uh, how do I click this? Oh, no, I clicked down here. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so our learning objectives today are... It, it went, uh, it's no longer on the side screen, so... There we go. Okay. okay. Now it's up. Uh, our learning objectives today will be understanding the indications for imaging and headache and recognize common imaging findings in secondary headache and identify inappropriate studies in specific headache situations. And I'll just say, and we'll both of us will repeat this. Uh, the idea is basically, if you consider the patient to have a primary headache, there are really only very limited uh, indications for imaging, but secondary headaches most likely will involve imaging. All right, so we wanna look at this both from an imaging standpoint, as well as from a uh, clinical standpoint. So if we're looking at this clinically, we wanna talk about primary versus secondary headaches. Um, within the field of pediatrics, if you're looking at primary headache disorders, migraine is by far the most common thing that you're going to see. Uh, tension type headache may be a little bit more common in the overall pediatric population, but because those headaches are often mild, they don't always come to attention of medical professionals. So if you look within clinic, either a general pediatric clinic or even a headache clinic, migraine is by far the most common primary headache disorder that you're going to see. Uh, of the other ones, things like cluster headaches, the other trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, primary stabbing headaches, those are not unheard of, but those are very, very rare. So you will not see those as often. Uh, in terms of secondary headaches, uh, the things that we're going to talk about today are going to be ones that primarily show up on imaging, so things that can cause increased intracranial pressure, such as tumor, what used to be called pseudotumor, now idiopathic intracranial hypertension, things that cause decreased intracranial pressure, such as uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Uh, Chiari malformation is a rare cause of headaches, but we're going to talk about that because that's something you see on imaging a lot. Uh, and then we're not going to touch as much on things like infection. Uh, the other thing that is a big cause of secondary headache that we will not be talking about today is concussion and post-concussion headaches. And the reason why we're going to not talk about that today is because that doesn't really show up on imaging, uh, not something that is an indication always for imaging. Uh, but this is a partial list. This is not every primary or secondary headache. Uh, that we know of that has been described. If you want to see every single primary and secondary headache that's been described, go to the International Classification of Headache Disorders published by the International Headache Society. It's currently in its third edition. It's available at ICHD-3.org, and that has all of the diagnostic criteria for all of the headaches that have been characterized. And so when we're diagnosing a primary headache disorder such as migraine, these are the criteria that we use. Um, and so it, at your leisure, you can go look at that and look at that entire list if you're ever curious about the specific diagnostic criteria, but it's beyond the scope of this talk to go through the criteria for every, <clears throat> excuse me, for every single headache disorder. 
Uh, and then this is just a screen uh, shot from the ICHD3. Again, you can go there and that will allow you to uh, look at the specific diagnostic criteria for all the primary and secondary headaches. So in terms of evaluation for secondary headaches, and I'm going to say this a lot because I think that this is important, but history and physical examination is the most important part of evaluation of headaches and evaluation for secondary headaches. The history and physical alone is usually sufficient to diagnose primary headache disorders and to rule out secondary headaches. If there is concern for secondary headache, uh, your history and physical can help you to determine what workup is necessary, because there are a number of things that you can potentially do to work up the headache, different types of imaging, a lot of things that you can do, and you can't do all of those tests for every single person with headache, and so if you want to narrow down, well, what is the most appropriate workup to do, your history and your exam is going to help to determine what that workup, if any, uh, is going to be. So what are some of the elements of the history and physical that you want to pay attention to when you see a patient who has headaches? Uh, in terms of your history, you want to talk about onset of symptoms. When did the headaches start? If somebody comes in and they say, I've been having headaches for four years, I'm automatically much less concerned for a secondary headache than somebody who said, I have headaches that just started four weeks ago. So when did they have onset of symptoms? Some other characteristics of the headaches that you want to pay attention to, how frequently are they happening? How long do they last? The location? Uh, any sort of associated symptoms, whether that be migraineous symptoms, such as vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, or any other associated symptoms that would point you to some other disorder. We'll talk about some of the specific things in a minute. Um, and then any change or progression in symptoms. Now, sometimes people who have migraine can progress from episodic migraine to chronic migraine. Frequency can vary. So a change uh, or progression of symptoms doesn't automatically point you towards a secondary cause for headaches, but it's at least something that you want to think about. And so that's something that whenever I see anyone in clinic with headache, one of the questions that I always ask them is, have your headaches changed? Are there any new symptoms with your headaches recently? Anything different than before? And if the answer is yes, then you need to think about whether or not further workup would be necessary. Some things in the exam to pay attention to, obviously you wanna do a good neurologic exam. You wanna pay special attention to the cranial nerves to evaluate for any posterior fossa abnormalities that would be of concern. You wanna do a good head and neck exam. Uh, you wanna palpate over the occipital nerve. You wanna palpate over the forehead and over the um, superorbital notch, uh, over the sinuses. You wanna make sure there's no evidence of uh, temporomandibular joint dysfunction. Uh, uh, palpate for paracranial muscle tenderness if you suspect tension type headaches. Uh, so a good head and neck exam to help to rule out any other causes. And then probably the most important thing that you can do is a fundoscopic exam. If they have papilledema, that sends your work up in a completely different direction. And if they do not have papilledema, then that helps to rule out a number of secondary causes. In terms of what you do for workup for a secondary headache, again, history and physical alone is usually sufficient for the headache diagnosis, but when it's not, your history and physical is going to help to determine what you do. So what are some of the things that we do? Um, EEG is not indicated in the workup of headache, and that sounds pretty obvious. That's a very old school thing that used to be done more commonly, and I was even going to cut that out from this talk because I thought, well, nobody does that anymore. And just last month, I got a referral from an outside provider uh, who had done an EEG as part of the workup for the headache. So apparently it's still occasionally done, but there is clear evidence that it is not necessary. If you're only working up headaches, there is no role for EEG. If you're going to do imaging, the American Headache Society has published a position paper, which has also been endorsed by the American Academy of Neurology and the Child Neurology Society, uh, stating that if you're going to do imaging, MRI is preferred over CT. MRI is going to give you more detailed picture of the brain. It's going to show you more possible secondary causes for headaches. And CT obviously has radiation and has additional risks. And so there is no role for CT except in emergent situations, in trauma situations. Uh, there's no role for CT scan in the workup of headaches. And then if you suspect either increased or decreased intracranial pressure or infection, uh, then LP would be indicated. So what are some of the red flags? What are the, some of the things that if you see a patient in clinic and you're getting this history and physical, which is so important, what are some of the things that should worry you? Uh, in terms of your history, if you have sudden onset of headaches, um, again, abrupt onset, like I'd never have headaches before, and now I just started having a lot of headaches. 
Sometimes that can happen with migraine, but you at least want to think about secondary causes. Thunderclap headaches, which are headaches which by definition reach maximum intensity within one minute, is an absolute indication for uh, further workup. So uh, that is definitely something that requires workup. Same thing with new daily persistent headaches. That That is uh, an absolute requirement for, se- for workup for secondary causes. A new daily persistent headache is defined as a headache that is unremitting since onset. Patients can often tell you the exact day that the headache started, and it has not stopped since it started. There hasn't been a single moment that they haven't had a headache. Um, abrupt change in headache pattern. Again, that's more of a relative indication, but if there is an abrupt change, you want to think about that. Positional headaches suggest a problem with intracranial pressure, either de- increased or decreased depending on the pattern, and then persistently focal headaches. Now, with migraine, a lot of times people will have focal headaches. By definition, migraine is unilateral, at least some of the time in adults. In pediatrics, it can be bilateral. Uh, but a lot of people will say, yeah, my migraines are kind of right here most of the time. But maybe some of the time they're on both sides, and some of the time it's my whole head, and that's okay. If it's 90% of the time it's here, that's fine. If somebody says, I have never in my entire life had a headache that wasn't right in this specific exact location, that's when you worry about some underlying uh, space-occupying lesion, and that would be an indication for workup. And then in terms of your exam, any signs of increased endocranial pressure, such as papilledema or a cranial nerve 6 palsy, uh, any signs of meningismus or fever, other systemic features, uh, altered mental status, or any focal neurologic deficit, any of those things would be a red flag and would make you consider secondary causes. And for people who like uh, mnemonics and acronyms, this is uh, one that was published by Dr. David Dodick, who was the head of the headache program at Mayo Clinic Scottsdale for many years. And many years ago, he published this. And this is mostly in adults, uh, but I think a lot of it applies to the pediatric population, but kind of in a different way going over what I just went over in the last slide. So I'm not going to go over this entirely because I just said this, but if it helps you to remember it better, the SNOOPS S is systemic any sort of systemic symptoms, and is neurological, so any focal neurologic deficits, possibly by history, definitely by exam. Sudden onset, as I mentioned, the thunderclap headaches, uh, either very old or very young onset. The exact ages for those cutoffs are a little bit debatable. We don't have to worry about the older age uh, group in pediatrics, but in terms of younger, it's not an absolute cutoff uh, under five, but you at least think about it. Again, any change in the pattern of the headaches, Uh, headaches that are precipitated by Valsalva or cough. Um, The presence of papilledema is an absolute indication for workup. Uh, Pregnancy, fortunately, we don't have to deal with that as often, but any new onset headache during pregnancy has to be worked up for secondary causes. And then any phenotype of rare headache, again, in the pediatric population, it's almost always going to be migraine or tension type headache. And so if there's some other phenotype, uh, then you need to think about whether or not there are some other secondary causes. Okay, so uh, Rob's gone through the classification of headache and some of the red flags and so on. And we're going to deal with specific topics uh, today. Chiari 1, migraine, SIH, that's spontaneous intracranial hypotension, and IIH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And finally, a word about headache and brain tumor. So Chiari 1 malformation is an isolated malformation of the posterior fossa, and the tonsils go down below the level of the foramen magnum. Here you can see the cerebellar tonsils uh, abnormally low in position. And the classic findings in Chiari 1 are uh, abnormal descent of the cerebellar tonsils greater than 5 millimeters, uh, uh, congested craniocervical junction, uh, with often no CSF space at the craniocervical junction and uh, pointed tonsillar tips, the normal tonsillar tips being rounded. Uh, they may be less uh, severely pointed, like peg-like, and also you may notice a, a vertical orientation of the uh, cerebellar cell side. Uh, this next slide is just to distinguish the focal malformation that is Chiari 1, just tonsillar descent, the rest of the brain is normal. Uh, from Chiari 2, people get confused between the two. Chiari 2 is a general brain malformation. And you have, for instance, in this particular case, uh, dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. It's only a bit of it formed. There's a lipoma. The mass intermedia is enlarged. There's beaking of the tectum. There's a vertical orientation of the cerebellum. The fourth ventricle is elongated and displaced downwards. And so that's Chiari 2, not 
not a subject today, but as I said, that's just to distinguish PRE1 from PRE2. And you know, you can see the descended tonsils on the coronal view, but also this is to show how we measure this. We're using the plane of the foramen magnum at the base of the skull. And then we drop a perpendicular down to the tip of the tonsil. And that's how we decide it's greater or less than five millimeters. Usually this is done in the midline. We identify the midline by the presence of the cerebral aqueduct on the sag sagittal view. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, tonsils greater than five millimeters below the plane of the foramen magnum measured in the midline. Usually it's best to do it in the midline because the base of the skull is actually saucer shaped. It's not flat. So if you go off midline, the foramen magnum may uh, lift up slightly and you may be not able to get a consistent measurement uh, from scan to scan. Uh, the tonsils are usually pointed and the effacement of the CSF, we mentioned bony features. This can be a, a related problem of a small posterior fossa or a short clivus. And the patient will need an MRI of the uh, spine and spinal cord because syringomyelia is also a feature uh, associated with Chiari 1. And uh, the percentage who have syringomyelia varies widely, but approximately taking an average, maybe 50%. Uh, hydrocephalus is rare. Hydrocephalus, however, it can be associated with Chiari 2. And here's the sort of simple mnemonic I need to remember that sort of thing. A Chiari 1 has one cavity and it's a syrinx. And a Chiari 2 has two cavities, uh, the ventricles and has hydrocephalus associated with. Sorry, there'll be a, uh, you know, we'll raise up the level of discussion from simple mnemonics. Um, finding of Chiari is an indication on MRI of the brain is an indication to perform an entire spine. You can see that this kid not only has one syrinx here, but further down has a smaller syrinx. And uh, the terminology, <clears throat> um, there's the term tonsillar ectopia. A lot of people treat it as equivalent to Chiari 1 malformation. The problem with that is if you label a kid with Chiari 1 malformation, suddenly, you know, at school, he's not able to play soccer because he's got a malformation and this sort of thing. It's, I think personally, there's also the problem that in my previous uh, uh, associate in Chicago, the chief of neurology was very strong in this. Uh, don't call a Chiari 1 malformation unless you have a really solid Chiari malformation because unfortunately there are people, uh, mostly not pediatric neurosurgeons who will leap in and do surgery for Chiari 1 malformation when really there aren't the symptoms or indeed the imaging findings to really justify that. So here's my personal way of describing things. Low-lying tonsils mean normal. If it's less than five millimeters, the tonsils are below the plane of the foramen magnum, but they're not down to the level we consider pathological. Tonsillar ectopia means down below five millimeters descent, but normal rounded contour of the tonsil, no crowding at the craniocervical junction, and CSF is visible before and aft of the... Uh, Craniocervical, the cord and so forth at the craniocervical junction. Now, uh, Chiari true, the Chiari malformation, greater than five millimeters descent, pointed peg like tonsils, and a tight craniocervical junction. Okay, so looking at this then from a clinical perspective, uh, Chiari malformation is relatively common. It's observed on imaging in about 1% to 3% of MRIs, and it's usually seen as an incidental finding. A symptomatic Chiari is only about 1 in 100. So 99% of Chiari malformations that are seen on imaging are asymptomatic. And that's important to remember because that means that if you see a Chiari malformation, it's unlikely that it's going to explain headaches or other symptoms. And it's not something that the presence of it in and of itself is an indication for referral for surgical decompression. Um, and, uh, you know, as Dr. Curran mentioned, that's something that sometimes happens. I think that our neurosurgeons here do a very good job of evaluating Chiari's and determining when it's appropriate to decompress and when it's not. But unfortunately, that's not the case for everybody in the Valley. And so you need to be careful if you see one to not automatically assume that that's something that requires referral to neurosurgery or surgical decompression. 
So what are some of the features that would indicate that this is that 1% of the time when it is a symptomatic Chiari? Um, well, people will complain of posterior headaches and neck pain. So the headaches are exclusively posterior. If they say, well, sometimes it's my whole head, sometimes it's the back, sometimes it's the front, or if they have typical migranous features and frontal headaches, that is not consistent with a Chiari malformation. Exclusively posterior headaches with or without some neck pain and stiffness may be an indication of a symptomatic Chiari. Uh, the headache can be induced by cough or valsal that is a feature that if you do get that, that might be a little bit more worrisome that you do have a symptomatic Chiari. And then sometimes they will also have other chronic symptoms of lower cranial nerve dysfunction. So chronic dysphagia without any clear explanation or you know, chronic respiratory problems, chronic cough, that, that there's no other clear reason for that. Those would be indications of a symptomatic Chiari. Our next topic is migraine. And uh, I would just start off by saying there's basically no necessity to do neuroimaging in patients with headaches consistent with migraine who have a normal uh, neurologic examination and there are no atypical features or alarm signals present. And this is from the uh, American College of Radiology Appropriate Criteria. It's openly available on the web. And if you're thinking about imaging and you're not sure whether imaging is appropriate, you can simply go to it and they have multiple categories in each group. This is the category for, uh, you know, basically primary type headache. And you can see that usually not appropriate is the description for all of the possible imaging listed on the left. Again, acr.org, if you want to look at that. And the criteria for ordering an MRI, and Rob will also go over this, neuroimaging may be performed for presumed migraine for the following reasons, you know, prolonged, persistent, Course uh, aura, sorry, or prolonged or persistent aura, increasing frequency, severity, or change, first or worst migraine ever, migraine with brainstem aura, migraine with contusion by brainstem with motor manifestations, uh, hemiplegic migraine, late life migraine, uh, aura without headache, side locked, you know, unilateral always uh, headache, and post traumatic headache. Now, uh, still, if the migraine is classic and there's no other stuff, uh, there's no other uh, neurological findings or con alarm signals, imaging is not indicated. Now, patients do get MRIs, and one problem that turns up is migraine spots. And I'm going to just, we had a little problem with the slides, uh, the size of them, and they've been sort of changed a little bit. And so I need to put on my glasses to actually read them. So, um, MRI is normal in hemiplegic migraine. Uh, venous dilation can be seen on susceptibility weighted images, contralateral to the hemiparesis, although this is not typical, changes in cerebral perfusion have also been described, and we'll come back to that. And MRI may demonstrate T2 hyperintensities in the white matter of the centrum semiovale, and they're not dissimilar to small vessel deep white matter ischemic changes. These are distinguished predominantly on history, although a recent uh, T workup suggests that there is increased T2 signal in the cortex overlying white matter abnormalities as well in the brainstem. There are a lot of reports about abnormalities in migraine in, on imaging, but they don't actually amount to something useful that we can use. For instance, here is the this is from one of our uh, radiology sources on the web uh, called Radiopedia. And uh, the, a large survey found that migraine with aura had these spots about 8% of the time. Migraine without aura had these spots about 2% of the time. And the controls had less than 1% of these. But even the most common or the, the most frequent occurrence of 8% is still uh, a small group within the overall group of migraine. So, uh, and once you even find that, you can't sort of say, oh, well, this is migraine because it's got migraine spots. There is a differential for them. It could be manifestation of stroke, chronic small vessel deep white matter ischemic change, multiple sclerosis or other form of demyelination, and even a, cere a cerebral vasculitis. Just including that because the case comes up, uh, the question comes up, what do we do about spots on some kid who's had an MRI for migraine? So this is a different thing. This is the perfusion abnormality that's in sort of 
the sort of fairly new or fairly uh, discussed at the moment. So we have a 13 year old child who presented to our ED with headache, vomiting and nausea. And the parents in the ED report the child was confused, had otherwise a, neuro, a negative neuro exam, negative CT twice for prior C, uh, similar episodes. And by the way, it's not necessary to get a CT in every acute case. We do have the facility of a rapid MR. That's an MR where the, none of the sequences are longer than 30 seconds. And it's very useful because by and large, the kids don't need sedation and it's done very quickly. The whole scan takes a very short length of time. And so if you're worried about a mass in the brain, get a, a rapid MR, do not do a CT because that's radiation and uh, you'll get a, uh, clearance that the kid does not have some serious, uh, you know, mass in his brain. Uh, here's just to show that the, this is the T1 images from the T1 sequence are normal and from the T2 and the flare on the bottom row, those are two sequences that we rely on particularly to show up the masses and edema and so forth. But when we went to the uh, ASL perfusion, a type of perfusion study that we do, uh, you can see that uh, on in the uh, Actually, this is portrayed opposite to what normally is because of the nature of the uh, uh, display. And the right hemisphere is well perfused. You can see good perfusion in the cortex, both medially and laterally. And then as we go up uh, in the brain, we see that the uh, posterior left hemisphere is severely underperfused. And this is a phenomenon termed cortical spreading depression. And cortical spreading depression, also called spreading depolarization, is a wave of electrophysiological hyperactivity followed by a wave of inhibition. And spreading depolarization, uh, if discussed in isolation, can be termed a depolarization wave of neurons and neuroglia, which propagate across the cortex at 1.6 millimeters per second. We put in the velocity here because that's in terms of the brain, a very slow velocity, and I think Rob will also mention that velocities can vary in this thing. Um, here is a diagrammatic uh, explanation of, or at least illustration of cortical spreading depression. So uh, we have it back here starting in the occipital lobe, and then it gradually extends forward. Up here is the central lobule with the central sulcus, and you can see that it takes uh, 16 minutes before this depolarization reaches the center the middle of the brain, the central uh, lobule, the, the central sulcus. And this is just a case report from 2020 from neurology. And here we have cortical spreading depression on the, uh, the left, uh, the hemisphere displayed on the left side of the brain. I don't see a marker, so I presume it is the uh, left hemisphere, but uh, there's an increased signal uh, on the diffusion image and a little bit of hypo uh, intensity on the uh, ADC, suggesting that there's an element of possible ischemia in this condition. Okay, so we're admittedly a, a little bit off on a tangent here. Um, and so if anybody was planning on spacing out or taking a quick nap, here's your chance, just check back in in a few minutes. But for those who wanna go along with us, uh, because of these cool images of the cortical spreading depression, I do wanna talk a little bit about aura and cortical spreading depression. So going back to the ICHD3, here's how aura is defined. And I'm not gonna go through all of these criteria, but I do wanna point out that aura can involve many different uh, symptoms. It can be visual, sensory, speech, motor, um, so it does not localize well. There's not one area of the CNS that is involved with aura or with cortical spreading depression. Um, in terms of what the heck is cortical spreading depression, the short answer is we don't know. Um, it's something that was first described in 1944 by Liao, uh, who actually was studying epilepsy, not headache or anything else. But um, it has been something that has been observed for a long time, has been studied for a long time, but we still don't understand it completely. It is a slow propagating wave. Exactly how slow depends on the studies, depends on the animal that you are studying, but uh, it is slow, meaning it is not explained by action potentials. This isn't a purely neuronal phenomenon. It involves both neuronal and glial cells. It is followed by inhibition of cortical activity, which can last for a while. Um, it is associated initially with cortical hyperemia, followed by oligemia. But it's not unique to aura. Uh, 
Um, it can be seen in other conditions. It can be seen in stroke. It can be seen in traumatic brain injury. Um, and the mechanisms of initiation and propagation are still poorly understood. So even if something that has been observed for about 80 years, it's still something that is very poorly understood. Um, and the other confusing thing in terms of aura and tying that back into migraine is that about a third of patients with migraine experience aura. So that means that about two thirds don't experience aura. Not all auras are followed by migraine. So it does not inevitably lead to a migraine. Um, the aura does not always precede the headache. It can happen coincident with the headache. Um, and cortical spreading depression has been observed without any associated symptoms. So cortical spreading depression is neither necessary nor sufficient for aura. Aura is neither necessary nor sufficient for migraine. Um, so, you know, kind of to emphasize what Dr. Curran said already, migraine is not in and of itself an indication for imaging. You don't need to image it. It's not going to help with the diagnosis. It's not going to help with treatment. It is something that has really helped us to better understand what's going on. And we have been able to identify the underlying pathophysiology much better as a result of some of these imaging studies, but there's still a lot about it that we don't completely understand. Now back to our regular programs. So the next topic up is spontaneous intracranial hypotension or SIH. We try to refer to this as SIH and the hypertension, the idiopathic intracranial hypertension as IIH, because otherwise they sound like almost the same and it gets confusing. So uh, this is an extensive uh, systemic review and meta-analysis done from a group of uh, specialists in various hospitals in London and published in 2021, trying to summarize some of the aspects of this rather uh, difficult syndrome. So the inclusion criteria for this analysis was that it should be SIH or spontaneous CFF leaks, uh, intracranial hypertension or secondary CSF leaks, traumatic causes of CSF leaks or iatrogenic causes were excluded, the articles were those which had 10 cases. The article was in English and it was an original article. And uh, it's uh, defining spontaneous intracranial hypertension as a clinical condition characterized by debilitating headaches, secondary to spontaneous CSF leaks and or CSF hypotension. The, estimate, the estimated incidence is about five per 100,000 population per year. It's highly, to quote the article, highly under and misdiagnosed condition and its exact pathogenesis is not understood. Uh, the most common symptom by far, over 90%, is orthostatic headache. You get a headache when you stand up from sitting down and so forth. Uh, nausea in about half of cases and a significant 40% or so with pain and neck stiffness. And this total review is about 1,700 patients with SIH from 33 articles. So there are MR brain findings that have been associated with spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Uh, the most common one is diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement, basically enhancement of the dura, but there's also evidence of venous engorgement. And you may see in about 40% sagging of the brain, pituitary gland enlargement, subdural collections. But an important thing to note is that 18% or say 21 in five, 20% one in five, the MRI is normal, which of course doesn't help. And then we have the, the symptoms, the frequency just displayed in a graph. Again, the commonest thing is diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement. Uh, the, the least common finding is uh, subdural collection, but it's still in almost 40%. And then remember, one in five has a normal MRI scan. And here's the mnemonic, and you know, hours of work went into this. Beeps. So B stands for brain sagging. E stands for enhancement of the, uh, that should say pachymeninges, uh, engorgement of the dural venous sinuses, uh, pituitary enlargement, and subdural collection. And we're going to show some examples from the article. So this is the diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement, the bright rim around the brain where contrast has been taken up. This is an example of the venous engorgement. And first of all, if you look at the small insert, this is what, on a sagittal view, what a cut through the transverse venous sinus usually looks like. It's a triangle. But in these patients with venous engorgement, there is a sort of a semicircular dome appearance to the transverse uh, sinus on sagittal imaging. Uh, here is an example of an extensive subdural collection. 
And this is an example of both the uh, enlarged pituitary and the brain sagging. So the enlarged pituitary is uh, here enlarged up out of the cella and reaching up to the undersurface of the optic chiasm. And then the brain sagging is evident by, this is not a Chiari acquired or any other sort of tonsil ectopia. It's, it's the brain is sinking down and you can also detect it. it. I admit it may be hard to see it on the slide, but basically the optic chiasm is draped over the uh, bony structure of the dorsum cella. Um, and then what are the differentials for these findings? Well, there's no real differential for brain sagging. Leptomeningeal enhancement can be, uh, should be pachymeningeal, I'm sorry. Enhancement should be, can be seen in a variety of conditions, meningitis, metastases, post-surgical dural thickening or enhancement, and a rare childhood condition, idiopathic hypertrophic cranial pachymeningitis. So there is a differential for some things. Uh, the main thing to exclude when you find venous engorgement is to exclude dural sinus thrombosis. Uh, the pituitary gland enlargement in adolescent, particularly young adolescent females, the pituitary enlarges quite a lot, such that it may go up and reach the undersize, touch the underside of the optic chiasm. Boys uh, at, of the same age, the pituitary does enlarge. It rarely reaches the optic chiasm, but it almost does. But then later in adolescence, in both sexes, the pituitary tends to reduce in size. Uh, um, obviously, a pituitary mass can produce pituitary gland enlargement, such as tumor hypophysitis or apoplexy. That's a bleed into the pituitary scene, mainly in people with uh, um, prolactinoma. Subdural collection, well, obviously, a chronic subdural hematoma can occur from repeated trauma and so forth. And uh, what are the other features that we need to check out? Well, we need to do spine imaging because a certain number of the patients will have an extra dual CSF collection, and the series varies between roughly 50% or uh, three quarters. Uh, mainly in the thoracic spine, can occur at the cervicothoracic junction in about 25% and rarely purely cervical. Uh, to identify the CSF leak, we'll just, uh, which is a whole separate subject, but digital subtraction myelography or MR myelography with GATO is considered the, uh, the standard, the gold standard. Okay, so clinically, there is no one consensus uh, criteria for clinical diagnosis of SIH. There are a number of published diagnostic criteria. And in the interest of time, we're not going to go through all of these in great detail, but just to emphasize that some of the overlap is that you have to have evidence of a CSF leak, either by low opening pressure on an LP or by imaging showing a leak. And then you have to have some clinical features of uh, intracranial hypotension, uh, as well as possibly response to treatment for that. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through all of that, but that's kind of the key features. And so what are some of the clinical features that we think about um, well, actually, let me back up just a second um, and say that uh, th this is something that Dr. Kern's already gone over, so I'm not going to belabor this too much, but uh, a CSF leak or a CSF venous fistula can be uh, a cause of that. Um, the symptoms often mimic what we see from a post-LP headache. So if you think about a post-LP headache, those are some of the things that you think about clinically that you're going to see in spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Uh, relatively uncommon. Uh, it is something that's more common, slightly more common in females than males and more common in adults. So in the pediatric population, we do not see it as often, but we do see it. And so it is something that's important to be aware of uh, because as Dr. Kern mentioned, it is often missed or delayed. Um, this is a table uh, from the aforementioned article uh, looking at clinical features that we see associated with SIH, and the most common thing that we see is headache, and we see that, you know, 98% of the time, and almost all of those headaches are orthostatic headaches. Now, when we don't see an orthostatic component, that is usually for headaches that are long-standing. So for people who have a delay in the diagnosis, who have not been diagnosed yet, if the headache goes on long enough, you start to lose that orthostatic component. Uh, but the main thing that you're going to think about is an orthostatic component. So it's worse when they sit up or stand up, it's better when they lie down. Uh, in terms of other features, there's nothing that's really specific for that. So there's no specific location that keys you into that, to it being spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Uh, there are no other associated features. There's some things that we can see, but nothing that really points you directly towards that. The key feature is usually going to be that orthostatic headache. 
Um, and this is a, a, a figure from a study that was done by our colleagues, our BNI colleagues over at St. Joseph's Hospital, uh, looking at most common uh, identified causes of SIH. This is in adults, so I don't know that this applies completely to pediatrics, but it is something that just has identified three common causes when we do find causes. One is an uh, anterior dural tear secondary to an osteophyte. Again, that's not something we're going to see very often in the pediatric population. Uh, a nerve root diverticulum is not impossible, and a CSF venous fistula is not possible, but there are plenty of times where we don't identify a specific cause for that. Okay, so <clears throat> our second to last uh, topic is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, IIH, as opposed to SIH. And basically, this used to be called pseudotumor cerebri, or sometimes termed secondary intracranial hypertension. Uh, it used to also have a name benign intracranial hypertension, but that's out of favor because the patient may actually suffer visual impairment. And the only real imaging finding that is looked for is a stenosis in the transverse sinus, and you can see a uh, fairly extreme narrowing here in this particular patient. Um, the pathogenesis is basically a uh, translation of this collection. We don't have a clue. Uh, decreased CSF production, uh, absorption, increased CSF production, increased intravascular volume, increased intracranial venous pressure, hormonal influences, but the cause is not really understood. And what we're looking for on imaging is bilateral venous sinus stenosis particularly. Unilateral can be suspicious, but it's considered most likely if you have bilateral venous stenosis. The lateral segments of the transverse sinuses is the most important finding if you have stenosis there. And you should also be able to exclude current or remote uh, sinus thrombosis. Okay, so, you know, as I mentioned, spontaneous intracranial hypotension is something that's fairly rare in the pediatric population, so something to be aware of, but something that honestly you're not going to see very often. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension is something that is common. This is something that, that you will definitely see and probably have already. Um, it's seen most commonly in women of childbearing age. Um, it can be seen in, in males, but that's most common. Um, and so adolescent girls is a, is a, a risk factor uh, for this. Uh, the annual incidence is about one to two per 100,000, but in obese females, that increases to 20 per 100,000. So uh, obese adolescent females is the highest risk category. And so that's something that we will definitely see. Again, there is a relationship, male or female, uh, prepubital or pubital, uh, between this and increased BMI. However, it has been observed that even in non-obese patients with recent moderate weight gain, uh, that can also be a risk factor. Um, so what are some features of the headaches that make you think that maybe this is due to IIH? Um, they'll complain of headaches, uh, almost certainly. Uh, the headaches are often described as early morning headaches. They will often be described as pulsatile, and they will often be described as retroocular. Problem with that is that could be consistent with migraines. So that's not something that if you hear that, you automatically think IIH. Uh, but certainly those are some characteristics that if you have other features, you think about that. Uh, they will sometimes complain of some neck stiffness. That's not an invariable feature, but something that sometimes can clue you in. Uh, pulsatile tinnitus is something that is much more specific for IIH. So if they complain about that, that definitely is more of a red flag that I'm th you're thinking, yeah, this could be a pressure issue, either IIH or some other secondary cause of increased pressure. And then and visual disturbances, specifically transient visual obscurations uh, or diplopia. Um, they can have vision loss. Initially, that can be an increase in the central blind spot, but then later on, uh, a loss of peripheral vision. That's a late finding. So hopefully you've identified this before it gets to that point, but later on, they can describe uh, peripheral vision loss. So Dr. Deb Freeman and colleagues first proposed diagnostic criteria, clinical diagnostic criteria, uh, for pseudotumor cerebri syndrome. Back then, that's what it was called, now IIH. Uh, this has been periodically reviewed and reaffirmed, and so this is still considered to be the gold standard for, di for uh, clinical diagnosis. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through every single feature of this, but what I want to highlight from this is that 
the diagnosis of IIH is not made exclusively based on an LP. So if you do an LP for whatever reason and the opening pressure is elevated, that does not automatically define IIH. They have to have other clinical features as well. They usually have to have papilledema uh, and then you have to rule out other causes. But if they don't have papilledema, you can still do it, but only if they have other specific criteria. So it's not diagnosed based on opening pressure alone. Um, and this is uh, a little algorithm uh, that we have uh, that we use here at PCH uh, for uh, diagnosis of IIH and to kind of very quickly go through it. Uh, basically, if you have papilledema or cranial nerve six palsy and you have features, suge clinical features suggestive of IIH, you want to do an MRI and an MRV because a venous sinus thrombosis can be a common secondary cause of increased intracranial pressure. If you see anything that needs to be addressed on that MRI, you address the secondary cause. Otherwise, you do an LP, and if it's elevated, then you've diagnosed IIH. If they do not have papilledema and do not have a six nerve palsy, but they still have clinical features that are highly suspicious for IIH, you still do the MRI. If that shows some of the specific findings, which I briefly alluded to on that last slide, uh, then you do the LP. If they don't have any of those features, then you really consider an, another diagnosis. Um, but I want to speak briefly about CSF opening pressure because I kind of glossed over this before, but the way they define it in the official criteria in the pediatric population is greater than 280 millimeters. Um, but there is a little bit of a debate because there isn't really good normative data for opening pressure in the pediatric population. Uh, the criteria for IIH uh, that uh, I just mentioned mainly relied on this study to define it. Uh, and this is a study from 2010 where they looked at 210 children, 18 years and younger, and they did opening pressures and they you know, decided what was abnormal based on that. And they defined abnormal opening pressure, uh, elevated opening pressure is greater than 90th percentile based on this data. And what they found is that using that data, an opening pressure of greater than 280 millimeters is considered elevated. However, they noted within that study that patients under moderate to deep sedation had higher opening pressures, and there's a positive relationship between BMI and opening pressure. Um, and as I mentioned before, the most common or the, the highest risk factors for IIH are obesity and then female gender and adolescence. Um, and so uh, that's something that, that uh, is going to be a situation that we will face a lot when we're doing these opening pressures. Uh, however, they did have 52 patients within that study that were neither obese nor under sedation. And in those 52 patients, 90th percentile uh, for opening pressure was 250 millimeters. So this is a small study. This is just one study. Again, we don't have a lot of good data out there about how we define a normal opening pressure. And so there is going to be a little bit of, de of a debate. In my opinion, I think that there's a range under 250 millimeters. We can probably consider that normal. 300 or higher, we can probably consider that abnormal. In between that, I would say it's borderline. And then we need to use our clinical judgment. And if they have other features that are suspicious, then we can probably call that elevated. Uh, but it's a little bit tricky and you can't really necessarily base it exclusively on that. Uh, there, there is a little bit of a gray area. So uh, we move to our last topic, uh, just to give you sight of the finishing line. And this is brain tumor and headache. And uh, this was a publication a few years ago, and it said brain tumors are diagnosed by imaging rather than referral, and guidance is required on the indications and appropriate wait times until imaging is obtained. And uh, the UK people in particular have done uh, a lot of work on the presentation of childhood CNS tumors and the number of symptomatology that children can present with with brain tumors is extensive. Uh, however, we're going to concentrate on one particular study in pediatrics. Uh, um, uh, 2010, and basically uh, they looked at information. As you know, the National Health Service in England has a lot of data based on. Uh, records from uh, family practice and so forth. And so they looked at uh, um, studies, a lot, very large number of studies. They ended up with 74 papers. 
in uh, the meta-analysis and they excluded a lot of things. They were looking for the presentation symptoms of brain tumors. And, uh, you know, they excluded ones, for instance, that had less than 10 children and so on. But uh, we decided that since our patients suffer headache, and anyone who's had a bad headache knows it, it renders you non-functional, that in sympathy with the patients, we should subject you to a little bit of kephalgia transiently by showing you this really complicated looking graph. And while you try to figure it out, uh, never fear, I shall dissemble it. But basically, along the line here at the bottom, are symptomatology, and these are symptom uh, combos, two symptoms combinations. And uh, the main uh, listing is for the symptoms that are combined with vomiting and the symptoms that are combined with headache. And if we look at the right side of the graph, I put it up here, this is the probability that children with this symptom combination have a brain tumor. And you will notice, and they're marked, the probability is marked by these little triangles. And you will notice uh, that there are uh, elevations in some areas. Some do not even have a triangle, which means children with that symptom combination did not actually turn out to have a brain tumor. And then the common symptomatology that we sometimes see referrals for of headache and vomiting uh, has almost no incidence. Uh, relatively speaking, the probability of a brain tumor is very low if a child just presents with headache and vomiting. Uh, here's a more detailed uh, look at the symptomatology. And here is your uh, vomiting and here is your headache. And as I said, the triangle is very low. However, there are a set of uh, uh, elevated triangles. So children presenting with these symptom complexes are, I think, you know, you should have a lower threshold for sending them for uh, imaging. And that would be uh, vomiting and uh, uh, visual problems and vomiting and unsteady on feet, in other words, gait abnormalities. In fact, the combination of vomiting and uh, gait abnormalities uh, is the most likely to produce a brain tumor. And by no means do all the children with those symptom, symptom combinations, I want to make it clear, have brain tumors. It's just that within that group, the probability is higher. And here, just to emphasize that, is uh, the headache and vomiting combo, very, very low probability of a brain tumor. Vo you probably need to get some other uh, reason to do imaging in those kids walking in, because as you know, kids can have headache and vomiting from 101 different causes like GI upset or infection or just over excited about something. Um, visual symptoms and vomiting, gait abnormality and vomiting, uh, the same two paired with headache, those have somewhat elevated probabilities of uh, brain tumor and therefore a lower threshold for getting imaging. Okay, so we're almost out of time. So I just wanna emphasize a couple of things really quickly uh, before we wrap up. And uh, there are published evidence-based practice guidelines for evaluation of children and adolescents with recurrence head recurrent headaches, uh, published by the American Academy of Neurology, available at aan.org. Uh, and I want to just briefly emphasize, we've talked about some of the, the recommendations already and some of the evidence behind that. But um, one of the key things from here, obtaining a neuroimaging study on a routine basis is not indicated in children with recurrent headaches and a normal neurologic examination. So kind of piggybacking on the data that you just saw and other studies. So uh, that is something that is out there as an evidence-based uh, recommendation. And the neuroimaging should be considered in children with an abnormal neurologic exam uh, or other features that we talked about before the red flags. But normal exam, chronic headaches, not an indication for imaging. And again, this is available online for anybody who wants to look through that and look at all the primary data from that. Um, so hopefully from this talk, we have given you a better understanding of the indications for imaging and headaches, uh, allowed you to recognize some of the common imaging findings in secondary headaches, and hopefully identify inappropriate studies in specific situations. In conclusion then, Imaging is not indicated in the diagnosis of primary headache disorders, but can be very helpful for secondary headaches. As I have said before, history and exam alone uh, can oftentimes establish a diagnosis of a primary headache disorder and rule out secondary headache disorders, but history and exam can also both indicate the possibility of a secondary headache and help to guide appropriate workups. So you always start with your history and your exam. Uh, 
If you're going to do imaging, MRI is the preferred imaging modality to evaluate for secondary headaches. And then although there are some pitfalls in the measurements of uh, CSF pressure, an LP is nevertheless useful if increased or decreased pressure is suspected. So thank you all for your attention, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. One question here in the in the Q and A that I'll go ahead and start, and I'll read it this way so everybody in the uh, Zoom can hear it. It says, "Thank you for the great talk to both speakers. Is there any radiological clue to differentiate between congenital unilateral transverse sinus hypoplasia and transverse sinus abnormalities, which may be seen in IIH or venous thrombosis?" Um, well, the IIH uh, is usually a focal stenotic area. Whereas uh, congenital problems with the transverse sinus, usually the whole uh, transverse sinus is usually hypoplastic. So I think that's, uh, you know, not uh, too difficult uh, differentiation to make. I think you saw from the single picture I showed that the stenosis was fairly uh, selective and it's often in the lateral aspect of the transverse sinus, whereas congenital narrowing or even uh, marked hypoplasia of the transverse sinus is usually throughout the length or at least the majority of the transverse sinus. As regard distinguishing it from sinus thrombosis, really with sinus thrombosis, we want to see an absence of flow or actual filling defect. And it's often, uh, you know, sometimes it's ambiguous in terms of identifying whether there's thrombosis present or not, but a post-contrast uh, CT venogram may help because the uh, clot will obviously cause a filling defect in the contrast. And so I, I don't think the differential is too difficult, but you may need to go to a CT venogram to make that diagnosis. Okay. I had one more question. You, you made the point about headache and vomiting not being uh, related to uh, you know, brain tumors. Uh, on the other hand, I didn't see anything in there where they differentiated the, the average type of vomiting versus uh, wakening up in the middle of the night and vomiting. And I can think of, a, I remember one of our preceptors in residency, you know, picked that up on a phone call where the, she was overhearing a resident say, you know, oh yeah, that's fine. And she said, wait, wait a minute, they, did the mom just say that the kid's waking up at night to vomit? And he said, yes. And she made the kid get an MRI and had a brain tumor. And uh, I've had one and one of my partners diagnosed that on a four-year-old wall check of a kid who wakes up in the middle of the night to, to vomit. Right, yeah. uh, sorry. Okay. Um, I mean, if there's a space occupying lesion, there should be abnormalities on exam, and that's something that's been well documented. But certainly clinically, that is something that can be a worrisome feature, uh, particularly if that's the only time they're vomiting. So if you look at migraine, if you construct a histogram of migraine hour by hour throughout the day and say, when does migraine most commonly happen? In the pediatric population, it can happen any time, day or night. There isn't a particular time of day that it's more likely to happen. So if somebody has typical features of migraine and they have vomiting with their migraine, migraine, but last month they had one that happened at two in the morning, but they happen first thing in the morning, they happen in the afternoon, they happen in the evening, they can happen at any time. That's not a worrisome feature. If it's happening primarily or exclusively at night and waking them up, then that's when that is definitely a red flag. And that is something that you need to worry about. Uh, but again, there should be, if, if they have, if there is an underlying tumor, they should have some abnormality on exam uh, that clues you into that as well. And then lastly, from uh, one of our neurosurgeons, she said, thank you for clarifying that an opening pressure of 250 is not high. We still get referrals to consider shunt with opening pressures at 230, 240 in obese kids. Frustrating. Yeah. Um, well, again, I would emphasize that we don't know. There's, there's not a lot of great data, and so it's a little bit ambiguous. So I, I can't say definitively that that's going to be a, a normal opening pressure, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't automatically assume that that's abnormal at that level. So we'll give one one question from here in the audience, and then we'll close. Going once, going twice. Okay, you must have done a okay. great job. Because there have no questions. There's a hand up back there. Oh, there was a hand up. Okay, yeah. Um, and can you repeat the question? Yeah. So the question was, if, if you, if somebody has an MRI, uh, they have migraine and they have those, those, uh, white spots, uh, what do you tell them? 
Um, I basically tell them that that's a very nonspecific finding that although that's seen more commonly in migraine, it's not unique to migraine, uh, but there have been studies that have been, have been done that have followed that over time and shown that that to be of no clinical consequence. Um, so it's a benign finding. We don't completely understand it. Uh, there have been studies in adults where they followed those spots out and gone all the way to then doing autopsy to try to find out what it is. And on autopsy, they can't find anything. So uh, on, in pathology, there's no abnormality seen. So the exact significance of those is unclear, uh, but it does seem to be pretty clear that it's benign. So I just emphasize that it's benign. It's not diagnostic of migraine, but it's a little more common in migraine, but not really something that we worry about. Okay, thank you all. If you have any additional questions, feel free to come up here, but otherwise you can get to work.